What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Mass Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Leah Matthews and Julie Mitchell. How y'all doing, ladies? Chief. Good to see you again. <laughs> I know, I know. Is, this, is today our Day Friday? Day three. Is today our Friday for Chief Chat? Is that <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So we have an outstanding guest today that uh, is here to inform our viewers on the organization he represents that truly cares for our country's enlisted boys. Uh, without further ado, Julie, do you mind introducing today's guest? Chief, you're right. We do have a wonderful guest joining us today. He's going to have a lot of great information to share. He served his country for 31 years in the Navy, retiring as a Master Chief, and he's still serving the community today as the President and National Commander of the Non-Commissioned Officers Association. Please help us give a warm Chief Chat welcome to Paul Kingsbury. Hey. All right. How's everyone doing? How are we doing? Wonderful, man. How you doing? I'm doing great. You know, adjusting. And I mean, at this point, after a year, we're adjusted to this new environment as we were talking to ahead of time. So, you know, lots of great work. I'm staying busy, not just with the Non-Commissioned Office Association, but my work with the U.S. Naval Institute and the podcasting I'm doing on my own in support of the Chief Petty Officer's Guide that I think we're going to touch on. So. Excellent. Paul, thanks so much for taking time out to join us. Um, just a real quick housekeeping. You guys know if you're watching, drop a note in the comments, let us know where you're tuning in from. If you have any questions for Paul, um, you can leave those in the comments section. We'll be reading those live. You can start your watch party. So you'll enjoy this live interview with your friends. And if you're not following our page, you should, because we have cheap chats every week and following us lets you know who's coming up next. So, Paul, before we get started with the interview, I just want to kind of, you know, share a little quick story with you. Um, we, we, um, I got a message or a DM or whatever they call them now, uh, <laughs> now they do, on, on my Facebook from uh, Michael Graybo. I, I don't know if I'm saying oh, it right. Oh, yes. Right. Yeah. Mike so, Graybo. Yeah. So, absolutely. So, he, he's the vice chair of one of your chapters out there in uh, Sacramento, uh, California. Yes. And so, he, he saw one of the shows, and I think it was Matthew McConaughey, and he was, he was a... Uh, he was he was digging it and he was like, hey, chief, I think I think he's a re retired first sergeant, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. From the airport. Yeah. And so he was like, hey, I think you need to uh, I, I want to get you in contact with our with our leadership here at NCOA. And so I I, um, I, I emailed him or I sent him my email address. He sent me his email. I guess he had done some research and, you know, we had already had you booked for the show. So so oh. it was, so it, it was cool that, you know, you're you're in demand. It, to, to be uh, on this show, but we had already uh, had you booked and everything. So he was like, oh, never mind, Chief. It's, I found out that <laughs> yeah. he's already booked and you're good. You mean go. an Air Force person late to the game? Come on, that doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, with that being said, thank you so much for being a part of the show. Uh, we really appreciate, uh, you know, finding out more about the NCOA. And uh, can you tell us where you're coming from today? Yeah, so I'm uh, here in Carrollton, Virginia, which is in the greater Hampton Roads area. So those, you know, in those kind of circles. So we're close to Langley Air Force Base for the Air Force, you know, and then we got, uh, you know, huge, you know, Norfolk Naval Base, which is the largest Naval Base. So I'm in that area. And uh, um, we have some Army, there's here, there's a joint uh, base where Navy and Army share a joint base down Virginia Beach. So I think the entire joint force is pretty much here uh, in some way or another, but that's where I'm at and uh, weather's good and it's not too cold here, so. Awesome. So, Paul, you served 31 years in the Navy. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your career. And well, what led you to join the military and then maybe some career highlights? Okay. Um, so, interestingly, you know, I'll preface, uh, you know, in the Navy, I don't know if you've heard of that. We're going through, you know, we selected all these new chief petty officers. So, they're in the middle of initiation season. So, I've been doing a lot of engagement with those chief selects, we call them. So, I get this question a lot. So, I'm going to try to truncate it because 31 years is a lot to put in. It so <laughs> I grew up in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale, um, you know, solid middle class family. My you know, dad worked for Eastern Airlines, which is no longer around, but um, but they got me to, you know, you know, a Catholic, I grew up Catholic, so private high schools, you know, good education, but I found myself not getting a lot of guidance on what I wanted to do with that education. Um, and kind of just kind of thinking about wondering what I was going to do. I had some ideas, but no real clear direction or plan. So um, these forms started coming in, these cards, you know, Air Force, Navy, Marines, you know, and I was like, okay, what's this about? 
and I was immediately drawn to either Air Force or Navy, right? It's like, I knew I wasn't going Marines or Army, um, just not my thing. And then long story short, I, I decided to go Navy and uh, got into the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program, um, operate nuclear power plants on aircraft carriers. So I did that for you know, the first 15 years of my career. Uh, and in that program, you, you advance pretty fast because it's high demand, um, high turnover, right? And uh, so advancement is fast and they reward that uh, high pace and that technical expertise with quick advancement. So um, towards the end of that time period, I figured I wanted to get into this world of organizational management or the command chief world on the Air Force side or the first sergeant world. Um, and uh, I applied for what we call a command master chief program, got accepted into that. And I did that for the last um, half of my career in progressive you know, levels of experience. So some time with ships, squadrons, like we talked about, it was Joint Region Marianas out in Guam. Um, and then uh, Japan time a couple times, one that's on the ship and then once as a command master chief for Navy region, Navy forces Japan. And then went to the Naval Safety Center and then finished up at uh, a major command on the Navy side called US Fleet Forces. And then uh, retired and got presented the opportunity to work at the US Naval Institute. So I do that now as the co-director of outreach and as a brand ambassador for them. So hopefully wow. that captures everything in <laughs> three that, minutes. That's a lot of ground, <laughs> 30 it years, an impressive career. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you for sharing that. So let's switch directions a little bit. Um, uh, for viewers who may not know, can you tell us about the NCOA? What does the organi organization do? And then how does it help the military community? Okay, absolutely. So. Um, like I said, this is, uh, I serve as their president and national commander. It's a voluntary position for me. And I was asked to, because I was relatively younger, um, but it's a, what we would call a military service organization. It used to be focused heavily on veterans as a VSO, but uh, we're more shifting towards the military because we recognize, you know, we have a lot of stakeholders, but really um, there's a lot of things we do. And I've really captured in the three lines of effort. So the one traditionally that we do is advocacy, um, legislative advocacy, and then government outreach too. So um, NCOA, Non-Commissioned Officers Association was established in 1960 and it grew out of a time period before we had a robust senior enlisted structure, right? You, you gotta think the E8 and E9 pay grades were only formed in 1958. So there was no Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. There was no Master Chief Petty Officer Navy. There wasn't a Command Chief Program and those kind of things. So. Um, so the, they really relied on these organizations to get a voice up into Congress. And then um, that's what they were doing. And initially, they got into also um, doing some low rate insurance. So they had offices around on the bases and kind of going doing the Geico USAA thing before that, you know, was big with those lines of effort. So um, and they did a lot of good work. You know, if you talk to older members um, to really advance pay, to, you know, make sure benefits were protected, you um, legislating for things like GI Bill, tuition assistance, and a lot of these programs. So um, although the military can't be formally unionized, we do serve as that voice, right, across the services, across active duty, retired, National Guard, um, veterans, and try to represent all those different constituencies um, to the policy and decision makers, right? So that's one key line of effort we did. We just hired a new, you know, what we're gonna call now chief advocacy officer, so with a new Congress in place, a new administration coming in, it's time for us to engage with them uh, and really use the digital space in a more aggressive way to help advocate for, and, and in many cases, it's not advocating for new things, it's advocating to protect things. But at the same time, we're always going to take on challenges like that modern, you know, um, the modern environment poses. Uh, so that's the one big thing we do is the advocacy. The second thing we do is I think there's an educational arm of what we do or that I want to build. Um, it's one of my you know highlights or my focus areas as the president. But, uh, you know, it's just informing a public about what the enlisted force does. So part of the advocacy is not just advocating for benefits and protecting benefits, but I want to advocate for the accomplishments and the capability of a modern enlisted force. So there are still those who hear the word enlisted. And there's a mind model um, that they throw back to something 50, 60 years ago. And since shifting to an all volunteer force, investing in you know, education programs, 
becoming more professionalized as an enlisted force, um, more leadership education development. Um, we've got young um, airmen, petty officers, um, Marines, Coasties coming in, in some cases as, as with master's degree, right? Choosing not to get a commission, but just wanting to serve and have that experience. So it's an it's interesting space, but I really value education. I wanna highlight that force, but I also wanna find opportunities where we can help educate and inform on benefits, um, transition assistance um, resources, or just, hey, what's going on um, with the uh, Department of Defense at, at large. So I started hosting a thing in that venue called uh, Commander's Call. Um, and I host different guests. I had, you know, Chief Pat McMahon, who was the old STRATCOM senior enlisted leader, um, had him on. And, you know, I had the former senior enlisted advisor, and the chairman, John Troxel on, right? So again, just an opportunity to, to highlight to our audience and to that broader enlisted force, what's going on across the joint force. So that's another piece um, under that education arm too, internally members, you know, we have a scholarship program. We have one for dependents of the members, but also we have a one called the Betsy Ross scholarship fund. So that one's to help supplement um, any kind of, you know, occupational or educational training that spouses of NCOA members want to pursue. So that's kind of a subset of that education piece um, that we uh, apply our funds towards. And then the final thing is always just with these memberships, you know, there's a, you know, kind of a fellowship piece and a network piece, right? So what makes, I think, Enlisted Force strong is our networking and our contact power. And Chief would understand that, right, through the top three. And my experience with the Navy Chiefs mess is through that worldwide reach of senior enlisted and enlisted, you can get access to really any resource or information to help solve problems as you need to. So NCOA is an extension of that, right? Um, we have many chapters around and we're looking to grow the local chapter membership. Um, but also there's a digital component to that membership now to where you don't have to be in a local organization anymore. We can, can be connected digitally. Um, so we're looking for new ways to, to dial up that voice of the 80% of you know, the enlisted force and represent that. So um, that's a lot of what we do. I know there's a lot there, um, but I'll, I'll touch on resources towards the end as we go. So I mean, you, you touched on uh, educated enlisted members. And so um, I was watching this uh, podcast yesterday with between uh, Chief Master of the Air Force, uh, Joe Bass, mm -hmm. and the Senior Enlisted Advisor for the Space Force, uh, Chief uh, Roger Toberman. And he was, on okay. our show. he was on our show yesterday, but they were talking about culture and they were getting questions from the field. And they talked about um, that all the service chiefs are, are, are talking right now about the disparity between pay between enlisted and officer because mm -hmm. it hasn't been looked at in, in a long time. And as we're, we're getting uh, uh, more skilled and certified and, and educated, how we can kind of, you know, bridge that gap between the pay between the officers and enlisted. So um, I thought that was a, that was definitely something that, that struck the chord of a lot of people that were watching specifically enlisted about yeah, it's no go ahead oh no i was gonna say that's the exact kind of thing that i want to advocate for these days right so you know i think overall pay and benefits are are pretty solid right i i didn't get a lot while i was active duty and i don't hear like hey i'm not getting paid enough per se um we got robust benefits you know that medical packages um insurance t you know gi bill tuition assistance um there's a lot of people who have gone to the table to advocate to get those things for us. And, you know, I don't hear a lot there, but where I do hear now is it's an interesting space as that enlisted force has evolved and the capabilities and the skills and the knowledge that they bring, right? Now you get into talent management and how you compensate that force, right? Absolutely. So, and you know that, right? As a senior enlisted, you know, one of your roles, at least in the Navy side is, hey, you know, train and educate your division officer, or, you know, in many cases, you've got more experience, perhaps you've got the same or more education, right? So, but you get paid less, right? So I've heard that and I'd be definitely interested. I think there's a space where we can work with the service chiefs and help uh, the service senior enlisted at least and help dial that conversation up. So that's good insight for me to pull the string on. Absolutely. So uh, can you tell us about how people can join the NCOA and uh, what are the benefits of being a member? Sure. Um, so you can check out our, our website. That's kind of where it is, www.ncoausa.org. Just It's got to have the USA on the end because there's also a National Council on Aging. And then I think there's some Air Force NCOA stuff. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, the acronym does compete with other things. So that's why the USA is on the end. 
Um, and hopefully you can put that out to the audience, but if they check it out, yes. they'll see um, that there's a tab that says membership who can join, but really it's open to any active duty enlisted across the joint force. Um, and that's, you know, like I said, it's not just active duty. It's, it's veterans, it's retirees, it's national guard, um, that whole swath of enlisted, right. Um, all the information on, you know, membership, the benefits is there, but we do offer, when I talk about um, membership benefits, so yeah, I'll start with, you do get some stuff, right? So there's some member benefits. We have partnerships with 20 different organizations. So you can get discounts on a wide variety of things, you know, uh, medical related stuff. We've got partnerships with schools and colleges for reduced, um, you know, tuition and things like that and opportunities. I mentioned our scholarship programs, that's a member benefit the Betsy Ross fund. Um, we have a disaster relief fund that's available to members, right? So, in, and there's a lot of that going on these days, but we've helped families with the wildfires um, or if, you know, perhaps there's a, a death or something and you need help, you know, um, traveling or something like that. So that's available to members, but I encourage people to get under, they're all listed under that mentor. I can't even go through them all and take forever. So there is the good personal benefit piece. Um, also, you have the opportunity then to join a local chapter if there's one in your area, or if you can get, you know, five total members in an area, you can establish your own chapter, right? And then um, this links me to the next thing is membership is also what you do for the organization, right? So um, yeah, there's membership costs that go with that. They're not expensive. It's about 30 bucks a year um, and it, it's tiered on pay grade, right? Um, but you know, we have things we got to do. We have to fund these lines of effort. We have donations from people, but also membership heavily helps us do those things. So you help us enable these lines of effort. So if you want more robust advocacy, right, we have to pay that chief advocacy officer. So we, we need to be able to, you know, rely on membership and donations and sponsorship to help us achieve those lines of effort. So um, I think that's kind of covers all the member, you know, benefits, but definitely the website is the go-to source and take a look and see if there's something there for you and then reach out to one of us and, you know, we'll give you some more background info. Yeah. And we'll, and we'll post, we'll post the website. In the, okay. In the feed. It's like your office also works with the exchange retiree advisory council. What's your role on the council and how does that help strengthen the exchange benefit? Okay, so that's that position I told you, right? Um, that we, it used to be, you know, our legislative affairs office now, the chief mm -hmm. advocacy office. So again, they bring that perspective from our constituency or the feedback we get. So back to that point about protecting and strengthening that benefit. I think that's the biggest voice that we can do. We connect ideally, um, you know, end user feedback and represent that on behalf of NCOA. But I think these partnerships of advocacy, you know, we're a member of the military coalition. There's a couple others that we're, you know, we are partners with other organizations in, and this, the one you mentioned is, is one of those. So I think it's um, in many cases, it may bring new ideas, but in some cases it validates what other people are seeing. Uh, so a stronger joint voice into the effectiveness of the exchange program, um, because I've heard, you know, like I said, in many cases, I think we're protecting things from getting cut. Uh, and I've heard talk about, you know, melding commissaries or, you know, reducing benefits or opening them up. Um, there's definitely opinions about that. So we hope to capture those opinions and bring those into that council. Excellent. Thank you. Yep. So Paul, uh, you're also a leadership expert. You wrote the second edition of the Chief Petty Officer's Guide um, and you're a podcaster as well. So can you tell us about the book and your podcast? Sure. Um, so I was, uh, long story short, so I got into writing, you know, obviously I'd written while on active duty and I did a lot of distance learning courses, which required a lot of writing. So I honed that skill and I was always given feedback by my commanding officers or my peers that, hey, you really write good emails. And I would write articles for newsletters and newspapers on the base and stuff like that. But um, when I was at the command mass chief at the Naval Safety Center, um, I was introduced to the U.S. Naval Institute and Proceedings Magazine. And what they do is provide a forum for, for Naval, right, Marine Corps, Navy, and Coast Guard. It's a forum for them to bring ideas and, and to debate things, right? So I had heard experiences and, you know, as a senior enlisted leader, one of my, my key roles is advocating that voice and translating those concerns up. So I decided to start writing, got published, um, placed in a couple of their essay contests, 
wrote a few more articles. They asked me to come on their editorial board. So I did that for a year to help them, you know, figure out what kind of articles resonated uh, with, you know, concerns in the fleet at the time. And then about, I don't know, after that, they'd seen, oh man, we get this chief petty officer's guide because it's published by the Naval Institute Press. It was first published in 2004, but it was way outdated. Um, it wasn't relevant really anymore. And it wasn't, no one was buying it. No one was aware of it in the Navy cheese mess. So I was obviously, you know, in the mix now. I was involved in Navy leadership development efforts. So they knew I could write to some extent. Um, and then they approached me and said, hey, would I be interested in revising that guide? And they'd gone to several people before, but no one ever brought it home. So I agreed. I thought it was valuable. I had a passion for it. So I took a year, um, you know, on my own time. And, you know, there we go. We got the second edition of the Chief Petty Officer's Guide. Um, and then, you know, that's been going out. And then my work with the Naval Institute is to help promote and develop other books. So um, I just submitted the manuscript with another Navy first class petty officer for a petty officer's guide. So we will have a continuum there, right? Blue Jackets Manual, Petty Officer's Guide, and then Chief Petty Officer's Guide, at least on the Navy side. Um, and then the podcast was the next step. So when I first got to the Naval Institute, they host the Proceedings podcast. So if you're published in Proceedings Magazine, um, you know, we'll reach out depending on the topic, right? Because there's a lot of people published, we can't do it with everyone, but you, you know, you're eligible, frankly, at that point to come on the podcast. Um, and then, so I started co-hosting that with uh, topics of, you know, with enlisted authors. Mm -hmm. And I started to say, oh, this podcast thing is kind of easy to do. Once I learned the, the production software side of it, you know, um, it's not really easy, as you guys know, right? It just, yeah. It's yeah. not hard do, do to it. learn, I guess I would yeah. say, but it does do take give time. You a side eye right now. <laughs> yes. No, it takes. <laughs> yes. I saw my that. No. Yes. Oh my gosh. I, I'm, yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Okay, yes. good. Good. You're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Giving you the digital side eye. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I said, hey, um, I think I wanted to talk more about leadership and management because, again, I was passionate about it. Um, but there, the bandwidth of the Proceedings podcast was only so much, right? And it's really focused on those authors. So I said, all right, as the author of Chief Petty Officer's Guide, I'm going to help self, you know, promote that, the content, you know, because when you write, there's only so much you can talk about, but there's so much more that goes into that topic. So I said, all right, I'm going to start a podcast that's going to build upon the content of the Chief Petty Officer's Guide. I'm going to bring on guests that we can take theory and then put it into practical context with, you know, personal stories and experiences, um, and then uh, I was like, what am I going to call it? Right. So I looked up over my desk and, you know, the, the weapon of the chief petty officer, right. That we wear in our dress ceremony uniforms is the cutlass. I was like, oh yeah, the cutlass. Right. So I started reading a little bit more about it and the attributes of the cutlass, right. St sturdiness, versatile, um, just how it was used kind of reflected how enlisted leadership is, right. It's it's tough. It's up close. It's not pretty. It's got to be up close and personal. And that's how the Cutlass uh, was used in, in battle and day-to-day -day routine. So I started the Cutlass podcast and I'm up to 28 episodes now, uh, oh, slowly wow. growing. As you know, it takes a time to grow an audience, but uh, you know, and then I'm going to, you know, I also take the lead on um, a, a, a new title on the proceedings or under the Naval Institute. I'm going to start what's one called from the deck plates. So that will be solely focused on enlisted perspectives, not necessarily people published. It, you could be, but it'll just bring another set of perspectives into the discussion. Oh, congratulations on all that. That's exciting yep. stuff. It is. Yeah. Yeah. I know when you, when you, when you talked about the podcast, uh, you know, Julie and Leah, they, they, I got here in August and they started this in March when the pandemic kind of kicked off. And um, they said there was a lot of tears that were shed during the, during the creation of this podcast. Yes. <laughs> so, I don't know what you're talking about. They're so yeah. crying on There's, Chief Chat. No. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, it takes, I mean, it's like being, like I tell people, you know, I heard this, it's like being a surgeon, right? As you go back and you post-produce and you can stitch together things and, yeah. but it, it allows you to be creative too. So I kind of, you know, it doesn't take that much time. I've got the bandwidth to do it and I enjoy doing it. And it's it's a it helps people so that, that that's yep. the the ultimate goal uh, of podcasts and these things. So, uh, Kent, you talked about uh, you know leadership, and so can you share what your insights on what you think a, a good leader or effective leader, or if if you had a maybe a petty officer come to your your office and, and say, hey, I'm about to step into this leadership position. Like, what advice can you give me? 
Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so late, later in my career, I came across, you know, I was on travel when I was in Japan and uh, the aide to the Admiral at the time was reading a management textbook, right? He was doing his master's degree work and, you know, we were on the long flight down to Singapore. So I was like, Hey, what are you up to? He's like, oh, I'm doing this work. I'm like, Oh, okay. Um, you know, and he was reading this chapter in the book called um, the conceptions of power and influence. So I kind of said, can I see that real fast? And I picked it up and I started scanning through. I'm like, um, man, this is good stuff. Right. So he sent me a digital copy of that. So I was like, started reading through and it just brought everything together. So I really, if you told me a young petty officer or airman was coming to my office, I would sit them down and, and draw a model up on a whiteboard. And I would ask them first question, right. How developed are your power bases? And um, they would look at me and go, what are my power bases, right? So when we talk about leadership tools, I build this framework on these um, eight power bases you've got, right? Your positional power, expert power, personal power, reward power, right? Some of this is introduced in leadership schools, but I don't think it goes into the depth you need to. So you've got these tools that you invest in your own personal growth with by building your power bases. Some of those are given to you through your position, right? You're given authority to make decisions. And in some cases, you know, you have the opportunity to give rewards um, unique to that position, or you have the opportunity to punish unique to that position. Um, in the chief's mess, right, we have connection power through our networks. So that's another reason why I'm big on professional and personal networking, because it really is a power base that you can leverage to your personal and professional advantage. So I would introduce them to power bases. And the other part that goes through it is how you, how I frame it is, say you have a hammer, that's your tool, right? But you can do several things with a hammer, right? I can hammer with it, I can pry with it, and then I can try to do all kinds of crazy stuff with it. It's not designed to do, right? So each of those power bases has an appropriate use or it enables a use. So those are called influence tactics. So these are things like rational persuasion or coalition tactics. And people will do these things, but they don't probably realize they're doing them or they don't do them to full effect. So then I work to introduce them into those influence tactics and then the final thing I would say is um, the muscle of those influence tactics are, is the strength of your communication skills. So then I would heavily tell them, hey, you got to be an effective leader. I mean, it sounds cliche, but you have to deliver messages and influence effectively. Um, your writing skills, oral presentation skills, nonverbals, listening skills, and then reading too, frankly, to build your dollar space. So um, that's the framework, frankly, I rebuilt the Chief Petty Officer's Guide around and that uh, I introduced. So whenever I talk leadership, I immediately, if you listen to my podcast, I'm going to build on those power bases and I'm going to dive into those kind of things. And then it blends into the situational leadership model too. Um, and then, you know, the thing is with leadership, there is no one shoe fits all, right? I could take the exact situation, the same problem set and engage in a certain way with certain influence tactics for one person and then turn with the second situation and try to apply it to another. And because they're totally different with their value belief systems or their, you know, their receptivity to your influence, it may not even work or it may even backfire on you. So it's just getting them to understand that um, it's a practice, right? You, it's just like doctors and lawyers, right? They practice because things are constantly changing. You're, the, the situations are all different. The people are different. So you, you learn from each experience and then you apply it as you go. So that's my, you know, I know there's a lot more to it, but that's kind of what I would offer at this point. That's great advice. Thank you. Well, Paul, 2020 is a pretty strange year for all of us. How did COVID affect you uh, in, in your work and then NCOA's work? Um, did it change anything about how you, how you operate? Uh, so yes, so just like all of us. Um, so one big thing was, um, so those local chapters, right? Have to deal with, just like all of us, any kind of up group, up close you know, group stuff got changed. Um, and people are doing things more virtually, right? So last year we did not do our annual conference symposium, right? So that was one effect. Um, and this year we're hoping to be able to do it, but it puts you in this kind of planning conundrum where you're like, hey, I want to execute in person, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to. So we're still figuring out if our annual symposium or conference is going to be digital or in person. That would be hosted in San Antonio uh, at June 23rd, I think is the time for it. So, um, other than that, it has on the positive side, 
Um, so one of the things I came in, right, I said the organization is older. It's been around a while. They were kind of late to the game with the digital space. Mm -hmm. So I've learned that. I really appreciate it. Like we were talking earlier. So what it's allowed us to do is to really bring the digital tools to our leadership and to our members, right? So like I mentioned, you know, I'm starting to do a thing called commanders, NCOA commanders call. It's a way for me to reach up and out with our membership, uh, but it's making people get comfortable on these new tools, right? That they may not have been. Um, so I think that's really the big, um, big things that have been going on, but we're still, you know, as far as legislative advocacy, you know, again, a lot of those panels and boards are done digitally now. Mm -hmm. So uh, that line of effort hasn't stopped. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to build that educational line of effort. We're going to roll out a podcast. I think we're going to call it the NCOA Backbone Pro Podcast, right? Um, hopefully this month. We've got like three or four episodes recorded. So we're going to launch that. Um, so I think it's been actually a good opportunity for us to grow in a digital space as an organization needs to be in the 21st century. It's good. I mean, way to take a, a bad a bad situation and turn it into a, a positive, finding new ways to get your message out and, and interact virtually and uh, digitally. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, some people are not comfortable with it, but when they see the tools like these, I mean, it gets, it, it becomes a very powerful outreach tool. Excellent. And Paul, you've shared a lot of what, <clears throat> what NCO, NCOA is working on. Um, any big, in big initiatives that you want to expand on? And then are, wh what are the biggest issues that your members are facing right now, especially during this pandemic? Uh, yeah, so, so the initiatives really is, I'm, I mean, before initiatives, like I said, a lot of those are changing. Uh, I'm really in an awareness building process right now, right? So when you go to your average active duty person or veteran, right, and you go, you know, what's NCOA or the Non-Commissioned Office Association, many haven't heard of it, right? I was introduced to it back in 2015, 16. Um, they were hosting their annual convention out in Las Vegas, and Mashi Petty, also the Navy at the time, had another um, event he was uh, going to do. So they had a joint panel there of senior enlisted leaders across the services. So I get asked to step in the into that um, opportunity. Of course, I wasn't going to say no to going to Vegas and speaking at an event, but I, I was expecting when I heard non-commissioned officers association, I was expecting to roll into a room and see uniformed service members walking all over. And I walked into a room of, you know, um, older people, right? And that's okay. But I didn't see any active duty people, very few people in uniform. And then I was like, okay, what is this thing? So in the panel, the Q&A panel, you know, I was actually, you know, they're like, hey, we need help, you know, getting the word out. I'm like, okay, I'm there with you. I just need to know what you're doing and what you're accomplishing under that line of effort. So um, when this, you know, fast forward, I was going to try to start up a local chapter in Norfolk. I was just too busy with, you know, all the things I was doing towards the end of my career. But uh, once I retired, started working at the Naval Institute, um, the former president and national commander, Vince Patton, he was one of the master chief petty officers of the Coast Guard. Um, he called me one day and said, hey, I'm getting ready to, you know, it, I've been doing this a while, um, rolling on some personal things, um, you know, new personal pursuits. So, you know, you're communicating well, you're connected with today's senior enlisted leaders. Um, would you consider stepping into this role? So I did, but I, I immediately said, okay, my, my number one thing as the up and out communicator is going to be to build relationships and raise awareness with starting at the top and then rolling it down and then using venues like this to get the word out. So more than building an initiative right now, I want to build awareness and start to strengthen and draw people into what we're doing. So um, one thing we are building is a strategic communications plan, right? Talking to people, what we do, why we do it and making those things available. And then who's going to talk to who about what. And then, like I said, uh, hiring a new chief advocacy officer to make sure we're strong and relevant in that area and we can step off with a new Congress and things like that. Um, I've got all kinds of great ideas, but as I mentioned, you know, we got to have fiscal footing and we got to be relevant with communication tools in the digital age. So as I've mentioned, I'm building that suite of digital outreach tools and communication, right? So we're, we're going to look at our website and kind of try to make that cleaner and more effective. Um, but over the year, I expect that uh, another thing I've done is work to tighten up what we would call governance. So when the board of directors, they used to meet once a year and I'm like, nope, that's not enough, right? Um, we're going to meet 
And that's one of the things they used to meet at the annual symposium, right? So again, yeah. even that thing was put off. Um, so that's where I'm at, right? It's more um, awareness building because you before you can get advocacy in action, you need to build awareness, right? So if I want to in, enjoy membership or build membership, I just got to be bringing people in the space um, and then learning about, hey, I need to know what does today's, you know, we have so many seg segmented audiences, right? That I've got to kind of, so what veterans want, you know, us to advocate for is going to be different from what National Guard wants from spouses and family members and active duty. So I am interested in, hey, what is that younger active duty person who is in a digital space, right? What does an organization or membership in NCUA look like, right? What, what would attract you to us? What can we do for you? And how do we add that to our portfolio? So any of that feedback uh, is crucial. Um, as far as, you know, members of NCOA, like I said, I think most of it is, um, I mean, there's just a lot going on, right? There's a lot of political churn right now that people are disrupted by. COVID has disrupted their lives. Um, so in many cases, it's just um, reassuring people and, and trying to get them through the membership to lean on that fellowship um, as a support arm, right? So that's kind of what these networks bring too. It, it brings you support too. So that's what I would have to offer for that. Okay. So, I mean, as a military member, we, we all are super familiar with the exchange in some okay. form or fashion, right? Um, so it, it's, a, it's an absolute important non-paid benefit that service members have and their families. Uh, so can you talk to us about um, why the exchange matters and also, you know, share a time that exchange there for you and your family? Yeah. So obviously most of, you know, we have Navy exchange on our side, but I have used AFIs definitely. So like I mentioned, I was stationed in Guam, right? Uh, I was the command master chief for the Admiral that, you know, when we rolled into a joint region. So definitely, you know, having access to two bases and two exchanges was cool. So always the primary benefit is, you know, I love the tax free, right? And, the, and then the, the pricing is significantly lower than anywhere you're going to get outside the gate. So if I'm going to get, you know, big purchases, right? So this computer I'm on, you know, first stop over to the exchange, right? Just happened to be the Navy exchange. But like I said, these days, Langley is closer, right? So same benefit, same saving, same tax free kind of stuff. So um, that's where it's traditionally just been. But also when I was, you know, just realized me, uh, you know, my first tour in Japan was on the USS Juno. So we would pull into Okinawa, right? And the big place we wanted to go after being underway for a while, the first place you go, the bus would take us to the Air Force Base, right? Kadena, and then bam, to the exchange, right? So um, for a sailor, that's where you refill all your supply of whatever, good food or bad that you yeah. got, you know, <laughs> but uh they have everything you need there, you know, the, to, to meet those demands, right? Blankets. I mean, just things that most people would take for granted, right? So from a sailor perspective, to be able to go into Okinawa, um, where the Navy base is smaller and doesn't have that big exchange, um, AFES picks that up and fills that role for us. So um, there's a story when I was up again. So now my second time in Japan as the you know, command master chief for uh, Naval Force of Japan. And I went up to Masawa to speak at a sale of the year event. Um, as you know, Masawa is an Air Force base, right? It has some Navy squadrons on it. Um, so here I am, I get ready, I'm, I'm getting ready to put my uniform together and I'm like, oh crap, right? I had forgotten my shirt, right? So I'm like, how did I forget? <laughs> oh, right, so no. this is like, yes. So I Critical. got the whole coat, I got the tie, but for some reason, <laughs> don't have the shirt. So I'm like, okay. Um, so fortunately they, you know, the air force exchange had a Navy section, um, and they happen to have the shirt I need. Right. So believe it or not right now, that's just probably luck. Cause as you know, right. You can't fill the whole stock of an AFIs with all Navy uniforms, you know, cause you got to make it proportional. But I remember advocating a lot to AFIs and getting a lot of support in that position about, Hey, just make sure you have what sailors need to, when we're on these joint bases. So those are my experiences with the exchanges. Fantastic. Paul, we have um, viewers watching from all over the world right now, but before we wrap up, can you remind our viewers uh, where they can find out more about NCOA and then how they can get involved? Okay, so the first thing I'll you know ask you to do is check out again our website, www.ncoausa.org. 
if you end up on the National Council of Aging, you are on the wrong, <laughs> wrong page. So we are not that. Um, we do have older members, but we're not the National Council on Aging. Um, we recently established a Facebook page, so NCOA USA, right? So you can see all the commanders calls I've done, you know, and all the, all the, uh, that we have a currently doing a membership drive. So get back to the original thing. We do have a goal this year to, to uh, buy our national symposium to have a thousand new members or about 400 members into that, right? So they can check that out. Um, but our Facebook page is another tool that we're using to socialize up and out. We have a LinkedIn page too, NCOA USA on LinkedIn. Um, not using that too much, but there's opportunity. I at least wanted to get the footprint there. And then we have YouTube and Instagram. But again, I got to figure out how to operate in those, those digital spaces <laughs> and what we're going to use those for. So, and then we also, if you go to our website under the advocacy section, every week we put a thing called the NCO Advocate Newsletter out. So that covers down on things that are going on in the uh, legislative affairs space, leadership messages, and then also there's some member benefits and discounts and reminders in those. So those are the key things you can do. Just come check out our website out. And then uh, as always, I'll ask you, hey, just consider, I, you know, maybe it's, I, so we do compete, I guess you could say, right? So each service has their thing too. Like, so on the Navy side, right? There's a service Navy, Navy Association, there's tail hook, there's chief petty officers associations on the Air Force, right? You have the Air Force Sergeants Association. Um, I just want people to be in one of those, right? But um, like I said, we can bring some reach, right? That the active duty side can't re, re, um, bring. So check us out, give us a year, right? Like I said, 30 bucks is a small um, investment to help us achieve our mission. But what it does is it brings you into the conversation and the say of NCOA and you can help us grow and evolve to meet the demands that uh, today brings. And uh, also what, what, um, what platform is your podcast on? So, uh, so I've got it on all of them, right? So the, the Cutlass podcast, um, you can get it on Apple. You can get it on, it's, I mean, there's like nine of them. I wish I could roll okay. off. But, okay. So I do it on Anchor. Anchor's a platform I use and then it goes up and out on, a, it's on Spotify. It's on Apple. Okay. Um, I think it's on Google podcasts now. So um, yeah, I got a, got an email last week. This was kind of cool, right? It, it was number 62 in the government category for Apple podcasts last week. So I'm like, I, I don't know if that means wow. anything, but oh, congratulations. <laughs> congratulations. That's yeah. awesome. You're, you're yes. the top 100. That's, that's, uh, I know any, yeah. any, any music star would love that. I, I'm sure. Yes. <laughs> but if they just, uh, I also have a webpage that goes with it where they're all listed. Uh, it's www.cutlessleadership.com. Um, all my articles are there, you know, it's, um, and if people want to order the chief petty officers guide, sign copies, they can go there and then order those there at a discount, but uh, all the podcasts are listed there. Awesome, awesome. So uh, Paul, man, we had a great time chatting with you today. All and, right, yeah, this has been fun. Absolutely, and uh, we appreciate all the great information that you shared with us. Um, thank you and your family for your services and sacrifice. You know, you know, thirty. You said 31 years, right? Yes. And, yeah, man, that's, that's a commitment. That's definitely yes. a commitment, and you're still serving uh, long, long after you uh, hung up the uniform. So we definitely appreciate you for that. And just know this means so much to all our airmen, soldiers, guardians, sailors, Marines, and Coast Guard members out there wa watching. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, thanks again for this opportunity to use your platform to talk about NCOA and what we do and what we offer. Absolutely. So we wish you all the best. And uh, as you continue to make a difference to those who serve, we appreciate you, man. All right. You too. Take care. Keep chat out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm.